I want to die slowly. I want to feel my life slipping through my fingers. I want to sit on my own private hillside as I watch the last bit of light seep out of the horizon. Then I'll go where people go after they die. The thought of death has always fascinated me. When the time comes, I want to make sure and get the most out of it. This mystery that everyone spends their life wondering about. I don't see why I should be afraid. I was non-existent 20 years ago, and that wasn't all that bad. But here we keep on wondering. The purpose of this speech isn't to give you any answers, but maybe to provide some overdue questions regarding death, and to examine the relationship we the living have with death. One night my mom was driving me home from work. I can't remember why, but I was really sad. She was behind the wheel, and I was sitting next to her just minding my own business, when an 18-wheeler diesel truck crashed into us head on. I know, it's not the best way to die. I think freezing would be a good way to go. Jumping off a huge cliff would also do the trick. I casually release myself from the edge and spend the next 12 seconds or so thinking about what I just did. That does seem a bit selfish, though, to mutilate such valuable resource. I could donate my body to science. I guess that would be the most empathetic thing to do. But if it were up to me, I would have them throw my corpse in a forest to be eaten by the life surrounding. And this is when it starts happening all over again. In the words of the band, Andrew Jackson Jihad, I'd like to be a big ball of meat that bees could buzz around and eat when I die, so I might be given some sense of purpose. Isn't energy transfer fun? One of my pet rats is named Ginger. Ginger is dead at the moment. I always used to bury all of her pets when they died. Then I began to wonder why us humans bury the things we love. According to Oliver Morgan, a student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, burial isn't necessarily a public health requirement, contrary to popular belief. But what about respect for the dead? If left lying on the ground, a corpse would quickly find itself missing several body parts. Various scavengers and decomposers would feast upon the defunct machinery, and nothing would go to waste. Is this disrespectful? And how much do the non-living value our respect? Don't get me wrong, I think it's important to show respect for the memory of a loved one, but it can be difficult to separate respect for the dead from the deep fear of death itself that seems to be innate in us humans. Of course, to say that everybody thinks like this is an exaggeration. For example, in Tibet, they honor their dead with sky burials. Eyewitnesses describe this as a ceremony where the dead are fed to vultures, often after being torn apart and ground up. This makes perfect sense to me, but instead we insist on forcing whatever remains of the people we love into a box, and we hide that box in the ground as if to safely contain death and all his inconveniences. No, they'll eventually find their way out of their coffins and into the soil where they'll be fertilizing dandelions. But why the hesitance? And so, when Ginger died, I walked her out to the edge of the woods and I threw her inside. Then I went back home, leaving her to be consumed by a multitude of life. What better way to go? Anyway, Back to the moment of my death. An 18-wheeler hit my mom's Buick head-on, and I observed myself being thrown forward towards the grill of the truck. The shriek of metal colliding with metal started to give me a headache, but it was over before I knew it. It was over even before it began, and I found myself 
back in the car with my mom, driving home. I smiled, not because I was relieved especially, but because I was reminded that this is all going to end someday. It's like watching the clock when you're at school or at work. You might not be having as much fun as you'd like to, but you can take solace in the fact that it'll all be over with in just 30 minutes. If we could just make it past a few more weeks, a few more months, through the year, if we can just make it past this lifetime. Quote Andrew Jackson Jihad, Once an hour a day, I get very sad. But once that hour is over, I start to feel okay, because I'm reminded I rot away. I don't have much time to hang out here and cry. Though that may feel nice, I can't do that every day. Now, I'm not trying to say that death never fazed me. I've been terrified of it my whole life. Not my own, but that of those around me. I don't at all feel sorry for the dead. They have it easy. I feel sorry for the living. It's them that are hurting. This brings to mind a Dutch post-impressionist painter who spent most of his life being mocked, rejected, and otherwise ignored. As far as I can tell, suicide was the best thing that could have happened to him. It's said that an artist will ask for bread, but will receive only stone. After starving him to death, a stone monument will be erected in his memory. And it's true. Today, Vincent van Gogh is widely regarded as one of history's greatest painters. He died slowly, two days after shooting himself. One of the last things he said was, Dying is hard, but living is harder still. I'm not trying to depress anybody here. Neither am I suggesting that suicide should be any type of solution. But maybe we could use this as an example to help prevent similar things from happening in the future. What is it that adds value to life? What is one lack that makes death seem more appealing? William James, a pioneering American psychologist, said that the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Alfred Lunt, a well-known actor, said, There is nothing I need so much as nourishment for my self-esteem. And I couldn't agree more. Everybody I've met hungers for acceptance and affection as much as they do for food or water. We nourish the bodies of the people we love, but we often neglect to give them the appreciation that their self-esteem thirsts for. When I had this epiphany, I went through a time when I lathered everyone around me with affection. Just as a man, we'd eat hay if he were hungry enough. I found several people eagerly swallowing any compliment I fed them. It was then that I fully realized that I was surrounded by the starving. My little sister went through a similar phase, wherein she seemed incapable of going very long with, at all without reminding me that she hated me and she wanted me to die. I never thought she meant it, but it frustrated me, as I knew she had no idea what she was saying. To convey this, I used a ladder to climb to the roof of my house. I waited for my sister to appear in the lawn, and then I threw the ladder from the edge of the roof to the ground, telling her that unless she made some physical, physical effort to restore the ladder, I would jump off the roof and welcome whatever gravity had in store for me. I was certain that she would help me out, proving that she didn't actually hate me or want me to die, that she was in fact happy we were both very much alive. My hypothesis was inaccurate. She didn't seem to take much of an interest and preferred going inside rather than saving me from my threat, and I found myself stuck on the roof, trapped in a snare of my own making. While I was up there, I thought about the events that had positioned me in the precarious situation I now found myself in. It's a place I had been many times before. It's not that I pursue such disorderly conditions. Rather, I've observed that until such adversity is reached, 
one tends to avoid trying to remedy the situation. It's not that I mean to cause trouble. It's just that it's been my experience that peace can't exist without war. It's war that brings us together and makes us believe in our country again. It's death that puts a price on life and makes it worth fighting for. We go into the battlefield side by side. We run through fire and carnage, and all that matters is keeping our family together. And though there might be so much that we're still unsure of, we can take solace in one thing. One way or another, it'll all be over with soon enough. The guns will stop firing. The sky will stop bleeding. And you'll find yourself on your own private hillside, watching as a faint light grows brighter and new warmth spills over the horizon.